I have a question for you. Were you born deaf? No, I was born hearing. I became deaf at age three. And the reason for that was a genetic inheritance from my parents. They each have one deaf gene and one hearing gene, but by fluke I got the deaf gene from each of them. So that made me become deaf. My hearing went down when I was about three. And I have two brothers who are also in the same situation. When they were three, they lost some of their hearing. But all my other brothers and sisters, and I come from a big family, they're all hearing. Uh, do your family use Auslan or not? No. When we were young, my parents deliberated about what was the best thing to do. Should they learn sign or, you know, they, they really found it a difficult decision. But we already had a language that we could speak, English, and they felt that if we taught a sign language, it would become like a crutch. And um, it would, maybe we wouldn't learn to integrate with the hearing mainstream world so they decided that it was the best approach for us to become oral so and they they rejected sign language as an option where did you go to school and and is that where you learned to sign or did you go to a hearing school I went to an integrated school hearing school I was completely oral um I had a teacher's aide come some of the time to supposedly help with class, but really it wasn't much help at all. So my parents got rid of her and um, after that, it was just me lip reading and I was very bored in school. There was lots of hours just sitting there, really bored, trying not to complain. When, you, when did you learn Auslan? Look, I learned Auslan when I was 16 and at that time, I was away with my extended family, all my cousins and everyone at the holiday house. And one of my cousins said, I've learnt to fingerspell. Do you want me to teach you? And I said, yeah, okay, okay. So she taught me. So your cousin's deaf? No, this cousin's hearing. She just learnt it like at a lunchtime class at school or something. So she taught me to fingerspell. And we, we loved it. We practiced heaps and we became really fast. And we told all our cousins that we would teach them to finger spell if they wanted. And some of them learned. Yeah, we taught them. But really, they were much slower than us. We were very quick. So it was a little bit like we had a sneaky language. We could finger spell to each other quickly. My family were a bit annoyed with us, though. They said, you know, it's like a secret language. It's not respectful. We need to be open with our talk. So we're like, well, we'll teach anybody who wants to learn. Yeah. So that was a bit of a cause for contention. But later on... I changed schools and I was actually going to the same school as my cousin and they were having a sign language class there at lunchtime and my art teacher at the school actually said to me, oh, come, I'll come with you and we'll do that class. And I said, no, I don't need that. I don't need it. And I can lip read fine. But she begged. She said, no, come on, come on. So we went together and I was completely hooked straight away. I loved it and I couldn't believe it. Every sign that I learnt just etched itself into my mind. The finger spelling, I was already really competent at that. And the teacher said to me, though, this class is signed English, so really, for a deaf person, you should learn Auslan, because Auslan has its own grammar, and it's much better for a deaf person to learn Auslan. So I was very confronted by that, and I thought, oh, how can I learn a whole different language? It's too hard. But later on, at university, a friend of mine, another friend, said they wanted to learn Auslan. Would I accompany them on a, on a trip to the Auslan class? They said, yes, and I did. And the teacher there was Robert Adams, a deaf man. He was absolutely brilliant. Just great. And I was hooked again. And I took in everything really quickly. And it, it changed my world. And I felt that the first time ever I could mix socially, understand what everybody was having. I had access to people. And from that point on, I stopped lip reading and I switched to sign. And I was still oral with my family at home, but that was it. What's that? That's cute. Yeah, it's a little teapot. I bought it from an op shop when I was making this. I've, I've put it in. Yeah, that's great.
It's it's absolutely beautiful. Where'd you get it from? I made it. You made it yourself, yeah. Look, I, I had an idea for many years in my mind that I wanted to make a chandelier. Chandelier, God, that's hard to spell. Chandelier. So I wanted to do that, and I'd drawn up a lot of designs in my journal, and I'd thought about how I wanted to make it, but I had nowhere to put it at the time. The house was actually too small. But eventually we actually built a new bedroom, and it had a really high ceiling, so it was perfect. So I did a course in metalsmithing, and I learnt the skills to make, you know, bend the forks and make the wire and connect it all up. Hmm, that's great. My bedroom, it's the favourite room in the house. So this book, Asphyxia wrote this book, she's the author. So Asphyxia, I just want to ask you about this book. How did it start? Look, really, the book started from a theatre show. It was a while ago now. And I was, I was making marionettes at the time and I made a theatre show with them called The Grimstones. And then we toured that. We toured it really and performed it for a long time in a lot of different places. We didn't stay much at home for about five years. It was very exhausting. But somewhere in the middle of that, um, somebody saw the show and called me. And they were from a company that publishes children's literature, Alan and Unwin. And they'd seen the show and thought that it would make a nice kid's book. And would I like to write that kid's book? Well, yes, I absolutely jumped it, of course. So that's very exciting. Um, did they approach you, you say? Yeah, they did. They asked me if I would write the book and then they paid me in advance so that I could write it. They gave me an editor to work with. She was absolutely brilliant and I learnt so much from her and from that process about how to write and improve my skills. Um, and then I worked with my friend Janine Davidson and she's worked with me with the Grimstones for years and she's always done the artwork for the Grimstones like posters and flyers and so I asked the publishers if we could use her to illustrate the book and they said yes, they loved her work. So we, we did it together. Um, we didn't live in the same place, we lived in different cities but we would fly somewhere together hole up in a house and work hard on the illustrating, the painting, the photos, the drawings. So how did the actual idea happen? Look, it started a while ago. At the time I was a circus performer and I was touring overseas with my show, a different show, and I used to do hula hoops and adagio and trapeze. But look, after this trip, I went on a backpacking trip in Guatemala and I saw a man there whose name was Sergio Barrios and he was performing in the street with marionettes. And up till then I had really thought I didn't like puppets. I thought they were boring and you can't lip read them. But his marionettes, there was no talking. It was completely physical. It was emotionally expressive and they looked so alive. They had breath and movement. It was really captivating. And after the show I stayed and asked him if he would consider teaching me some of his skills. And he did. Right there on the streets of Guatemala, he taught me how to operate marionettes. And I came home and I made my first puppet. She, she wasn't a grimstone. Actually, she looks like me. But I loved performing with her. 
and I realised that I wanted to make more puppets. So it sort of went from there and that became the Grimstones. Great. Um, your creative focus, where's it at now? Like, you know, I know that recently you had an exhibition, but, you know, where, what are you up to now? What's next for you? Currently I'm really focused on visual art. That's my favourite thing at the moment. I'm really enjoying illustrate. I really enjoyed illustrating the book with Janine, and I asked my publishers after that. I had an idea for another book. It's set in the future. It's got a deaf girl as a character, and the book will be her art journal. So I'm working on that at the moment. I'm writing, and I've just sent off a draft last week to the publishers. So I'm glad that's done. <clears throat> so I'll start the artwork for that sometime soon, and in between that. I'm painting and I sell my paintings on the internet and really that's where most of my income comes from now and I'm loving that. Um, for myself, I have an art journal that I keep and I express a lot of my day-to-day -day life in that but I also experiment and play a lot in there and create ideas, artistic ideas and that helps my actual, my art life and help me to know what I want to make. Also at the moment though, I've almost ready is almost ready to launch an online journaling course so it's an internet course with videos and an ebook that explains how to do art journaling so that's just about ready so I'm thinking about that a lot and how to send that off into the world uh, you've got a lot of different things in there that's very exciting um, you've got a very full life sounds very busy yeah it's very busy I don't have a lot of time for everything that I want to do uh, recently I got some advice about my business and the guy who I was talking to said I really have to focus a bit more on a few things. I was doing journaling and um, metal smithing and jewellery and art and he said and writing, he said you've really got to cut a few things out. <clears throat> yeah, I can see how that is. Yeah, there's too much everything. So I had heard that you used to do your artwork in a bus, but this is your studio here. So this is this your new studio or what? Yeah, it is. Look, originally, actually, I started my artwork and I used to just work in a cardboard box. 
It was a tiny house, and every time I did a painting, I'd pack it up in the box and put it on the shelf. But as I became more serious, I commandeered the van. It was outside in the, in the garden, in the middle of the food forest. It's an absolutely beautiful setting. And I changed the table. I mean, I changed the bed to become a table and set up all my art supplies and my paper, and that was great. But the only problem with that is that if the family wanted to go on a camping trip, I had to take all my art stuff out. And, and it was getting bigger and bigger. And my art business was growing. And, for example, last year at Christmas time, I sold 70 original paintings. That was just from, from Christmas. So it was really flat out time. I was so busy with art. Paula, my partner, was busy with shipping everything off. We really needed more space. We couldn't do that in the van. So we expanded into the house and we had two tables set up so that we could work at the same time. But last Christmas, the house was an absolute bomb. So I, we're more organised this year. Yeah, look, I, I see that it might be hard to work in here because it's such a small house. But um, it does look like you're very, very well organised. So it looks like it works for you. Yeah, it does. Look, in the past I lived in much smaller space. Now we've actually ex extended the house. We've got a new bedroom and a kitchen, so it feels spacious for me. I know by normal standards this is still a small house, but for me it feels like there's plenty of space. And true, I am very well organised. I've got everything I use every day right here within easy reach. I can just find what I need and work quickly and efficiently, so it's great. Yeah, good. So is there any deaf people who have influenced you or influenced your artwork or even anybody who's influenced you in general? I think probably the biggest influence I had was from quite a while ago when I was still studying with Robert Adam at my Auslan course. He showed me a movie, Children of a Lesser God, with Marley Matlin. Oh, I was in love with her. She's just beautiful. And she showed me that a deaf person could be fantastic and capable, beautiful, clever, interesting, dynamic and successful. And I thought, oh, I was really captivated by that and I took on that concept for myself. And it was a long time ago, but it's still with me. Yeah, well, it appears to have worked. Yeah, yeah it does, doesn't it? So the next question I'll ask you, it's possibly a little bit negative, but have you um, experienced discrimination because of your deafness? Yes, look, plenty. Um, what stories do you have, you know, that you can tell me? Look, firstly, with my ballet career, I was very focused about my ballet, very serious. And my dancing was good enough at a particular audition I went to. I danced well, but when I did the medical, I failed immediately because I was deaf. I was just um, absolutely excluded because of that. Even though I could stay in time with the music, I had ways of watching people on either side to make sure I was in sync. I could get the tempo for the song and hold it, but because I was deaf, they just said no. In circus, it's much better. I've got opportunities, I have had opportunities to work with other companies like Circus Oz and other established companies, but they couldn't really change their work culture to include me. It would just take a massive change. They had the best of intentions and wanted to collaborate with me, but really it was just too difficult, too massive a change, and it's really expensive to have interpreters. So... That's really why I work by myself. I have my own business and I've made my own workspace deaf friendly and that's how I've survived in that way. Great. That's it. <coughs> so you're involved in circus, is that right? How'd that happen? I was working computers actually and that's where I got the money for this to build this house. One day I walked into my... Uh, boss's office is sitting there behind his desk in his suit and tie and he's juggling and I said what are you doing and he said I'm practicing because I've joined Circus Oz class and I was like oh really take me I was really keen on the idea of that and the very first class I was hooked like again yeah I loved circus 
And I, I grew up, of course, doing ballet, and I had loved ballet and dance, but really, as a deaf person, it meant I couldn't be a professional. So I had to put that aside. But in circus, of course, it had everything I wanted, the physical skill, but they kind of celebrate freaks. You know, they like diversity and difference. Ballet, of course, is all about homogeny. So I was very excited by this, and I did become a professional performer, and I worked in that field for several years and earned my income from that. I didn't work from computers anymore. Are there other deaf people you know involved in circus? No, certainly not at that time. Um, Australia, I was the only, the only one I knew of. Oh, really? Yeah, the only one. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you for helping us with our doco. And uh, see ya. Bye. Bye, my pleasure. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.